Auntie James Heapy, the Armed Forces Minister, is with us. Good morning to you. Good morning. Uh, give us a sense of what you think this morning, uh, James Heapy, when you see the footage of, of that attack on the maternity hospital in Mariupol. Utterly sick. I, I, I don't get what sort of government, what sort of military launches indiscriminate artillery strikes. Um, and that this is the best case, that it's an indiscriminate artillery strike against an urban centre which has hit a hospital. The worst case is that hospital was positively targeted. And um, how, how do we know? And, and how do we know that? I, I, how can we distinguish between the two? Because I say the, the end result is still uh, despicable. But can you ever find out whether it's targeting or incompetence? Well, I don't know that you necessarily can, unless you were to, at some point in the future, um, be able to access the orders that were given. But the fact is that if you are cataloguing these things. Uh, as potential war crimes, as we and many others in the international community are, the uh, you know bo both scenarios are war crimes. You know, either the use indiscriminately of weapons in an urban area that ends up uh, taking civilian casualties, or to deliberately target a hospital, which is really sick. Um, it, the, those are both uh, uh, probably war crimes and things. Therefore, that we are being careful to catalogue and to make sure that these things are there as evidence uh, when, as they surely will be, President Putin and, crucially, all in the chain of command below him. It's not acceptable to just say you're following orders in these circumstances. will be held to account for the crimes they're committing. Uh, can you explain something to us, uh, James? Because we've been talking about this for a couple of days, there, that days now. We're supplying correctly and morally you will you will say lethal weapons to ukraine the later that we're going to send laser guided missile systems they're going to be used to kill russian soldiers how is that different to poland supplying ukraine with fighter jets we've already committed as nato to giving ukrainians gear to kill people what's the distinction between a laser guided missile and a jet well i think that everybody in the international community is uh, drawing a line between giving systems that will allow Ukraine to defend its territory and its airspace from Russians who have entered their sovereign territory and sovereign airspace. In the UK, we're being very careful not to give uh, weapon systems that could be used in an offensive role to strike uh, into Russia. Um, now, clearly, uh, the, 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 the planes that the Poles are offering and, and others around Europe fly uh, MiG-29s as well, could be used um, to cross the border. But I think that you know, the, the Ukrainians are not the aggressor here. They want no, exactly. to just defend their, their airspace. Um, I, I, but the reason that MiG-29s are relevant and the reason that the US don't give F-16s and we don't give Typhoons is that it's pretty hard to become a fighter pilot. Uh, and so the countries around Europe that operate the planes that the Ukrainian Air Force already have are the ones who have the opportunity to give these capabilities if they choose to do so. Um, the reality is, is that the US, the UK, France um, probably couldn't hand over aircraft even if we wanted to because nobody would be able to fly them. I understand that, but would, was there any discussion in the MOD of the UK being an intermediary to get those Polish jets to Ukraine? No, and as the Secretary of State was very clear on, you know, these do need to be bilateral arrangements. Uh, and in fact, I think that to be fair to the US, it, you know, planes, once they are in the air in this situation, would need to be armed. And so for Polish jets to have flown to Ramstein Air Base, be fueled up, uh, armed, and then to take off from a US Air Force base into a combat airspace with the strong possibility that they then end up getting into uh, conflict with Russian aircraft. It was right for the US to say that it, as a nuclear-armed power, shouldn't be um, an intermediary in a process that the Poles could do themselves bilaterally. Uh -huh. um, and I think we, you know, the, 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 such, is, such is the daily rhythm in the MOD, to be honest with you, because the, it's these constant calibrations around what risks miscalculation and escalation that really consume us, because we are in a really volatile situation where miscalculation and escalation is, you know, an ever-present threat. I want to talk about that, because I think it's a really interesting point that you're making about the, the threat of nuclear war. I wonder if the nuclear deterrent is working in the wrong way, James Heapy. It's supposed to stop nuclear war, which everyone understands, but what it's actually stopping is conventional war. Putin knows that NATO will never fight at all because of his own unreliable finger 
over the nuclear button. So we've ended up with a nuclear deterrent that actually deters conventional warfare. And Putin knows that. And that is precisely what's led him into Ukraine. Uh, I don't share that analysis. I think that the thing that stops President Putin wanting a conventional war against NATO is that NATO would completely overmatch the Russian military, both in terms of technology and mass. But that's an argument for doing it, isn't it? Because that would stop war crimes, that would stop babies being killed, that would stop uh, Russia's uh, Russian aggression against uh, Ukraine. The nuclear deterrent will, will, will cancel itself out. It and we, we could but stop but them but in, in, in Ukraine, couldn't we? People have got to get out of the mindset of the sort of wars of the early 2000s we're in Iraq and Afghanistan and even in the Balkans. Um, you know, this is not where the UK and US military flies off somewhere, does its thing, uh, and the threat that materialises to the UK is a heightened terrorism threat, but nothing more. This is, uh, you know, you are inviting us to make a decision, no matter what our technological uh, superiority might be, no matter how superior our mass may be, you're inviting us to make a decision which is to declare war on Russia. And I think everybody who has appeared on your uh, show over the last few weeks as, as a minister, both from the UK and from the US and from around the NATO alliance, has been clear that that's something we should avoid because the consequence of entering the war is that you know, cruise missiles and, uh, and airstrikes will be launched against the UK. There is a way for the international community to support the Ukrainians very effectively through the military aid that we've been giving. Already we're seeing um, significant changes in Russian tactics. Uh, they are no longer uh, able to fly freely during the day. They failed to achieve air superiority as a complex, that, as a consequence. That is allowing the Ukrainians to maintain a ferocity in their fight that we didn't think possible, but you know, it is happening. And they are slowing the Russians down and denying them almost all of their objectives. And the, the, the weapon systems that Ben Wallace announced to Parliament yesterday is the things that we're currently considering and looking at the feasibility of how we would deploy them. They are a nighttime capability that will bring the Russians just as many problems around what they choose to do at night time as we've already given them during daytime. Just finally, uh, James, what's the current update on British soldiers going AWOL to fight in Ukraine? Do you have a number? And can you let us know what steps you are taking to prevent them from getting to Ukraine? It's a very small number. Um, three or four is the, the, the number I've heard. And I think we need to be very, very clear to uh, all British service personnel that it is, A, illegal to go AWOL in the first place, uh, and B, going to uh, Ukraine uh, as a trained, uh, serving British service person is spectacularly unhelpful and risks the UK being labelled by Russia as a belligerent in this, which is not what we are. Uh, and I, but I, you know, I, I, I get it, Stig. I, I've stood in the room at the start of my own military service where you um, attest to the British military and you offer to make the ultimate sacrifice in the name of what's right and to, in the service of your country. And I know that lots of service people will be watching the pictures on their TV screens this morning or hearing the reporting on their radios and then seeing the utter atrocities that Putin is inflicting on the Ukrainian people. And it pulls at some sort of sense of service and some sort of sense of doing right. British service people should be clear that they will not be doing the right thing if they take matters into their own hands. Um, the UK government is supporting the Ukrainian government. As you heard President Zelensky say to Parliament the other night, Ukraine has no better friend in the world than the United Kingdom. Um, British service people should continue with their duties keeping our country safe, and we will make sure the Ukrainian armed forces have what they need to keep the fight going against Russia. James, it'd be great to speak to you as ever. Thank you for joining us.